Hello there, Internet. My name is Adam from Powerbelt 3D. Back in the day, when I first started prototyping the Powerbelt 3D Zero, I really struggled with the calibration process. See, because the Y-axis and the Z-axis are so dependent on each other, it seemed a lot more complicated than my normal print-a-cube measure, print-a-cube measure process. So over time, I drew my own calibration models and developed what I think is a pretty good step-by-step -step process for calibrating this type of printer, and that is what I wanted to share with you today. First, let me explain a little bit about the differences between a standard 3D printer and a tilted axis conveyor belt 3D printer, and why the calibration process can seem a little bit more intimidating and a little more difficult. 3D printers in today's world use stepper motors to move them around, typically X, Y, Z, and the extruder motor. These work by applying an electrical charge to the electromagnets inside the motor to rotate it by a specific amount or to hold it in place. I'm not a stepper motor expert, but this is, you know, a simplified explanation. Every time the stepper motor moves, we call that a step. Typical 3D printer motors rotate in 1.8 degree increments, and we need to be able to tell the printer in the firmware how many of those steps translates into one millimeter of motion for the printer. This value can change quite a bit depending on the motors, the motor drivers, micro-stepping, and the mechanical setup of the printer. Now, if this is starting to sound a little bit intimidating, don't worry. Uh, your printer should show up to your door pretty close to the actual values for the steps per millimeter for your printer, but if you are struggling to make accurate parts on a regular basis, you might want to recalibrate. On a standard 3D printer, each axis is moved by one or sometimes two stepper motors, and this motion happens independent of all other axes. However, on an angled conveyor belt style 3D printer, the Y and Z axes both affect one another, and so we need to create some 3D models that help isolate each axis so that we can calibrate it. The first step I take is to calibrate the Z axis or the conveyor belt axis. And I do this by 3D printing a model that is only one layer thick. Because it's only one layer thick, this isolates the conveyor belt axis from the Y axis. After it's printed, we can roll the conveyor belt forward and measure the 10, 20, and 30 millimeter segments and compare that measurement with the true value that it should be in the 3D model. I like to run my zero off of Octoprint, so I'll be using that interface to communicate with the printer, but if you want to, you can connect the printer via USB and use something like Repetier Host or Pronterface in order to communicate with the printer. We just really need to be able to send commands back and forth to it. First, I'll enter the command M501 and identify the values for steps per millimeter, specifically looking at the one for the z-axis, since that is the axis that we're focusing on right now. Now we can plug in the current steps per millimeter, the measured value of our print, and the value of the true measurement in the 3D model, and calculate what our new steps per millimeter should be, like in this example. Now we can punch in the command M92Z, followed by the value for our new steps per millimeter. This will set the new steps per millimeter value for the z-axis. Then we can punch in M500 to save that value to the EEPROM in the 3D printer firmware. After printing the flat z calibration, I like to check the x and y axes by 3D printing a cube tilted at the same angle of the xy gantry on the printer. For us, this is 35 degrees. And just while I'm on that topic, I picked 35 degrees for the xy gantry angle after doing a ton of testing. I found that 35 degrees helped with uh, conveyor belt adhesion a little bit, since the filament path is a little bit more direct into the conveyor belt, so it's able to squish in a little bit more and stick better. It also helps with any overhangs on the leading edge of a print, like if you're printing a benchy, for example, and you have that slight overhang on the front, that way you don't need support material there. The next step I would take after we have calibrated the z-axis and the x and y axes if they need it is what I would consider more of an optional step. Um, if you do plan on printing a lot of very long objects, I recommend 3D printing a length of about 100 millimeters just to make sure that the conveyor belt axis stays accurate over that longer distance. 
Another area to look at is what I've been calling skew. Now this is something you don't have to worry about on standard 3D printers because all the axes are perpendicular to one another, but that's much different when you have the X and Y axis at an angle to the Z axis. The skew can be affected by a few different factors, and you can tell if you have a skew issue if the front and back face of a square model or a cube model, for example, they don't print totally vertically. Here I've messed up the Z steps of my printer just to illustrate the idea. Now I'm not 100% sure, but I think the biggest cause of skew issues is the angle of the print bed in relationship to the X and Y gantry. See, the XY gantry is fixed to the rest of the frame at 35 degrees by the sheet metal brackets, but the heated bed can be adjusted on the four bed leveling springs. If the front of the print bed is higher or lower than the back, this changes the angle of the hot end in relation to the print bed ever so slightly. Typically, I just eyeball how the conveyor belt lays on top of the heated bed, and that's good enough for me. But if you want to check specifically if the front of the heated bed needs to be adjusted at all, you can measure the distance in between the heated bed mount and the bottom of the heated bed and check those and compare the values between the back of the heated bed and the front of the heated bed and then adjust the height of the bed springs accordingly. By doing this, you'll make the heated bed totally parallel with the frame of the printer and by extension, totally in line with the same angle that the bottom of the frame would be to the tilted axis and your angle should be all set. If I'm still having issues, typically I'll just manually adjust the Z steps kind of again by eye um, until I get a result that I'm happy with. It's not a perfect fix, but it works for me. Another lever you can pull is adjusting the slice angle of your gantry in your slicing software. I recommend Idea Maker, and you can find the gantry angle in the advanced tab of your printer's setup. For me, usually adjusting it plus or minus one degree from the nominal 35 degree angle value does the trick. By the way, if you haven't seen it, I covered how to set up your Powerbelt 3D Zero in Idea Maker in this video on one of these sides. Um, and in the description of that video, there are links to the Idea Maker profile for the printer and for a handful of different materials if you want to check that out. From all my experience working with this type of printer, I've kind of discovered that the X and Y axes are relatively straightforward to calibrate. Really, the wild card is the Z axis. And so before we wrap up, I just wanted to highlight two factors that will affect the accuracy of your conveyor belt Z axis that might surprise you. At least they've surprised me over time. The first is roller diameter. If you decrease the size of the rollers, you'll need to increase the Z steps, and this will increase the accuracy of your conveyor belt axis. This is because a larger diameter roller travels a further distance per degree of rotation than a smaller roller. This is a little hard for me to wrap my head around, so let's look at two different circles. If we cut both of them and unroll them, a larger diameter circle will be longer than the smaller diameter circle. The other comparison I often think of is how the inside lane of a running track is slightly shorter than the distance on the most outside lane of a running track for the same reason. I don't know, maybe I'm over explaining here, but this is something that really surprised me over the past few years, and so I felt like it was worth mentioning. The second factor is belt thickness, and this matters for the same reason that roller diameter matters. If you change from a thick belt to a thin belt, or vice versa, you actually change the distance per degree of rotation that the conveyor belt axis moves. So, if you change from a thin belt to a thicker belt, you effectively increase the roller diameter and will need to decrease the Z steps per millimeter. If you change from a thick belt to a thinner belt, you effectively decrease the roller diameter and will need to increase the Z steps per millimeter. For these reasons, I recommend anytime you change out the conveyor belt, you recalibrate the Z axis of your printer to account for any variances there might be in thickness of the conveyor belt. Thank you so much for watching. If you happen to find this information helpful or interesting, why not hit the like button before you click onto the next video and, uh, and get on with the rest of your day. Uh, if you haven't already, maybe you want to subscribe to the channel. I don't know, it could be a good idea. Um, after all, it's totally free for you.
um, and it'll help you stay in the loop when I publish more videos on conveyor belt 3D printing. Another thing you might want to do is check the links in the description of this video. There are a few things there that you might want to check out. Uh, the first is a link to download all of the calibration models that I used in this video. You'll also find a link to our website where I did a write-up of everything I talked about uh, in case you want to reference anything later on. You'll also find a link to a podcast that I host where I interview different people from the world of 3D printing in the interest of having a transparent, no BS conversation. If you're into that sort of thing, feel free to check it out. Until next time, happy printing.